morning. It is a brand new year. Out with the old, in with the new. And I want to encourage you. God has great things for the year 2020 and beyond. He's got great things. And while it seems like maybe it's going in a bad way, it's not because God's in control. He is the God of the universe. He is not surprised by anything that's going on right now. Nothing. He has a plan. And you, as a child of God, are in it. So be encouraged. He has great things for this brand new year. It's time to look ahead, forward. Put the world behind us. Put the cross in front of us. Jesus our Lord.
I always think it's a good thing at the uh, beginning of a year to just remember the simple things about God that are very complicated if we think about them, but they're very simple too. He's there through everything. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he will never, ever leave you nor forsake you. I was seeking God the other night, and that's what he told me. He said, I am still here. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I am your God. That is good news. That is good news any time of the year. That is good.
the life and given us a new year to celebrate you and life. God, we love you, Lord. Thank you for running after us, Lord. And sometimes even when we feel like you're not around, you are, you're working things out. You're working it all out for us. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of time, but Lord, we're gonna keep our eyes on you because we've decided to follow Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen, amen, and amen. Welcome to 2021. Yeah, I hope it's come in smoothly for you. It hasn't been too rough as you've gotten started. Glad to see everyone here this morning. We do have bulletins. We don't hand them out because we let you self-serve. They're on the uh, tables there in the back. It's also hand sanitizer, which I'll remind you to use as you're here, especially if you touch other people uh, and, and, and like to do that. It's a good way to stay clean, stay fresh. <clears throat> if you've seen and you get our, our email that comes out, you know we have some people that are down with uh, COVID right now. And so we're praying for those families that they won't further be exposed and give others difficulty if you don't get our email and you'd like to we do have welcome packets that are uh, at the information station out in the lobby and you can pick that up and write in your name your information we'll be glad to add you to that we use that for prayer requests and and offering up praises and just informing the church of what's going on through email it's so much quicker than the snail mail that takes place. Also in the bulletin, uh, last week I didn't have anybody come up and say, hey, you didn't do the crossword puzzle at the end. But you'll see on the back, crossword puzzle, there's extra credit if you can get all the answers right. Uh, if we have time at the end of the service, I'll go through that today and come up with that. Hopefully they don't give a key up on the screen of what those answers are. You come up with them on your own. Uh, Back into regular programming starting this week. That's things like uh, a WANA club coming up on Wednesday night. Uh, we already kicked off with our first men's fellowship yesterday. We had a great time. And I want to thank James Creasy for coming and sharing his testimony with us as a part of that. That was really, really good way to start out the year. Um, any other announcements you can find either on the screen or, or here. We are, after we wrap up here in about 45 minutes, we have Sunday school offerings for all ages, from children through uh, senior saints. Uh, and one new offering that we're starting here in the month of January is a new class up in the library, which is to the left steps upstairs and in the library, and it's in his image. Mike Burns is going to facilitate that. I want to show you a, just a quick uh, trailer of this film put out by American Family Association. It was a summer day. My dad walked in the door and he said, Denise, I want to become a woman. I went through a brutal time of sexual distortion, molestation, led me into a lifestyle of being gay identified for eight years. I struggled with my identity all the way through my life, lived eight years as Laura Jensen, until I found the Lord Jesus Christ. The issues are unavoidable. They're on the news. The White House in rainbow colors. They're in our legislation. The Texas bathroom bill. In our schools. Drag queen story out. Our entertainment, our social media. They're even reaching into our churches. Let us be the church together. We're not just talking about issues. We're talking about people. I began injecting myself with massive doses of testosterone. Right here is the needle. The needle's about this big. 15 months on hormone blockers. Maybe another month of hormones. There was always this elusive happiness, but I never quite got there. And you began to realize that maybe this didn't fix what you needed to fix. We are taking biologically healthy young children and putting them at risk. Every church in America is facing this. Love and acceptance and inclusion. They are legally married. 
As Christians, we can't sit this one out. Neither can we straddle the fence or just leave it to the experts. Every believer has to discover the truth, and that starts by digging into the scriptures. Many people now say that my experience trumps scripture. Can we change God's words? We don't have the luxury to edit what God has said. Being created in God's image means that God's fingerprints are all over us. The man and the woman are created each for each other. There is a fittedness, that's the language. If Jesus Christ becomes your Lord, He is the one who is to identify who you are. I love my partner, I love my job, I love my entire identity behind. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Is it really possible that I can experience change? The fact that there's a struggle doesn't mean that you're on the wrong path. Obeying God is a struggle. Holiness is a struggle. There is hope for you. God loves you. And you are made in the image of God. I felt like light was bursting forth from me and I knew I was completely changed. church that we are made in the image of God that God has created us and he's created us male and female anything beyond that is what comes in through a culture gone uh, disarray a culture that's gone berserk a culture that has has just said anything goes because what's at the heart of humanity when we are born and raised up is a void of God that needs to be filled with Jesus Christ. But if we don't fill it with Jesus Christ, it gets filled with other things. It's uh, things like habits that we have. It's uh, all sorts of different things that are there. And so I want to challenge you to stay afterwards today as we start this. And Mike kind of takes your hand and leads you through this discussion, it's, it's, it's going to be more than just uh, watching the movie. It'll start today, but it's also the discussion of where we are because there's not a family that is not impacted by having some individual, a child, a grandchild, a sister, a brother, that has some gender confusion as they go through life. And, and we have the answer, the solution. It's God makes all things right. And so we want to share this in a loving, compassionate way. And so I hope you'll take advantage and be a part of this teaching that's going to start 1045 up in the library. Uh, we're going to continue on in our worship uh, with the message. So as I transition to that part, uh, just uh, bear with me. Uh, no, we don't take up an offering, but there is a box in the back. If you'd like to leave an offering or members leave your tithe, you can place it in that box and we'll uh, take care of it from there. 2020 was a difficult year, but it was also a blessed year. Not only were we able to meet all the budget requirements with a surplus, but last week, we were able to pay off the $20,000 debt that we'd owed since 2002. Uh, and so that was a wonderful thing. And thanks be to God for the body of Christ responding to that. So we still have a little money carry over there that we're going to just uh, put in the incubator and see how it grows too. You know, we're not going to just keep it there. You know, I always consider money like fertilizer. It doesn't do very good when it's all piled up. When you spread it around, it does great things. So, praise the Lord. Does anybody remember the message that I preached here at this church on the first Sunday, besides those who were in church yesterday? Sunday, the first Sunday of January of 2020. Anybody remember? There's a hand that goes up. What was it? I preach about, I always preach about love. That's like saying Jesus in Sunday school. It's got to be about Jesus. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sister. We did testify to love. That was a part of it. And that was going to be our theme for the year. And we're going to have testimonies throughout the year. And several of you shared testimonies through the year to testify to the love of God. 
But the actual message of that very first Sunday was 2020, a year of vision. It was having perfect vision. And little did I know that within 40 days, our vision would be totally rocked. You know, March 12th, that was my mom and dad's anniversary, but March 12th, 2020, it came down while I was with Albert and Bill and Rose and Jared on a mission trip in Puerto Rico that the World Health Organization came out and said there was a worldwide pandemic caused by COVID-19. Now, I know some of you call it the China flu, but uh, we'll just leave that out of it right now. Uh, COVID is how I will address it here. And it did change things. We uh, didn't get to finish our last two days on mission. We, uh, with the help of my wife, uh, were able to change our plane flight pattern. And we were able to be back here for our men's fellowship on that Saturday morning on March the 14th. We were in church on March the 15th as David Vaughn. Remember, anybody remember David Vaughn's testimony? Uh, he had a chainsaw and he ended up cutting his jugular vein and he lived through it. That was on March 15th. That's still on our website if you want to hear that testimony. I don't know if the sound quality is real good, but you can hear coming through what, what God did in his life. And then we're back again for worship on March 22nd and then we decided to close the official church services and they were closed until the Sunday after Mother's Day. During that eight week period, we started house churches. Eight different houses were opened up for us to meet together to pray and worship. And from then on, we've continued to open up with outside services and then moving indoors the 1st of July and then totally going back indoors the 1st of October because it's too cold to be outside. At, in Delta, Colorado at that time. And we just continue to roll with it. And we're going to continue to roll and, and seek God and what his favor is. And uh, we haven't had any uh, pandemic breakout in the sanctuary or in our classrooms or in any of our ministry programs. Uh, yes, there have been some people who've come down with COVID, but everyone who is a member of the church has recovered uh, except for I attended a memorial service for, bless her heart, uh, Edna Gray this last Wednesday. Her nephew, uh, Kenny Pettis, and nephew, Cliff Pettis, led the memorial service. Edna was 97 years old, living in a nursing home. Nothing got her down until COVID hit, and then that's what took her life. But blessed be to God, she's in heaven with him and not uh, not locked up in that prison that has become our nursing facilities these days. Pray for Crossroads. Uh, we know we have a member of the church that works there that's come down with tested positive with COVID. Uh, in fact, right now, this is transition with a prayer. Would you bow with me? Lord, I give you thanks, praise, and honor for how you've brought us through these days of pandemic, I also would throw in there the day, summer days of protest after Mr. Floyd was, was, was killed and uh, Lord also uh, the politics that we have gone through and they're still not over yet. We'll always have them with us. But through it all, God, you are Lord and you are Savior. And today we worship you. We come into this place to lay down our flesh and to rise up through the power of your Holy Spirit as the people of God, the body of Christ, to listen to the head, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I pray that through the preaching of your word, the foolishness of this preaching, that people will be able to draw closer to you and, and, and be able to say, I stand on the solid rock, the rock of my foundation, Jesus Christ is my Lord, is my Savior. And, and, and I trust in him with all my heart. And I, I, I commend myself, just as I did at the altar earlier this morning, just God, whatever is out of alignment with your spirit, bring it into alignment, even in this hour, in this minute, in this moment, that we might fully know and be fully known by Jesus Christ our Lord. 
In your name I pray, amen. Well, today I won't be so bold to say I know what the vision is going forward, but one thing I do know is my ID, my identity is in Christ Jesus the Lord. I have, I have petitioned and planned and purposed to center my life in Christ, and I want to bring you along with me in that, that Christ is our life, that we too can say like the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain you know you probably have your identity that you're carrying with you in your purse your billfold your pocket right now so you could pull it out and say I am who I am I've known people here in Delta though that have lost their identity and it's a difficult thing to get back I don't know if anybody here has ever had their identity stolen but that's a difficult thing to change some of that too. In helping some of our Corinne families uh, get their identification, we find that it's a long process of <coughs> sometimes having to petition the court uh, and also Social Security to get that. Uh, we had many birthdays that we celebrated on January 1st, 2021 in our Korean community because many of those people, when they got here from Thailand and they were going through customs, they didn't have proof of when they were born. But they knew the year that they were born, so the, our government decided their birthday should be January 1. So we had a lot of cards that we signed and sent out for happy birthday on January 1, even though that's not their bir actual birthday. Um, we also uh, see that uh, uh, the, the identity is, is, is something that happens with many people who are either homeless or in the system that they've lost a driver's license, they can't get it back. Sometimes they try to change their name because of their past. One of the things we find as we identify with Jesus Christ is Jesus doesn't look at you based on your past, but he looks at you as the person that you are and he knows your future. And that's what he sees because you may have a long history in your past, but it's not nearly as long as what your future is going to be. We see in scripture those that God raised up that often he would change their identification with the public. Uh, he took a man named Abram from his family, from a pagan family, from a worldly family, and he called him out of that to become the father, not only of Israel, but of many nations, of every nation that bows down to Jesus Christ. Abram did not continue with that name, but God called him to be Abraham. And that's what that name means, is the father of many nations. Uh, we also see in Scripture that his grandson, Jacob, Jacob was a deceiving, lying son of a, okay. Uh, but Jacob's name was changed to Israel because Jacob uh, did not fit God's plan for his future. And as Israel became the father of 12 sons, one daughter, Make sure we get that in there too. Uh, and he continued to uh, be what the nation is called today. His name as God renamed him. There was another man in the New Testament that met Jesus on the road. He was headed to Damascus because he was persecuting those of the way. Those who were following Jesus, this rabbi that had gone uh, gone wild and they had crucified and he was no longer alive and Saul of Tarsus was after his followers to put them down and Saul uh, met Jesus on that road and had a had, had a new life experience God changed his life right there now he didn't change his name right there but later on he found it would be better as he was going out to these Gentile people that he had a different name leave that past in the past 
And so his name was changed from Saul to Paul. I want to turn there, or you can follow the scripture on the screen, but if you have your Bible with you, or your smartphone, it's Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to start a few verses before I think they have on the screen. I, I always like to keep them uh, hopping back there at verse 3. But uh, Paul is speaking to the church in Philippi and writing in chapter 3, verse 3, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus, but no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Sounds like a little boasting, doesn't it? Well, why did Paul have more confidence in his flesh? Verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. That's what the law said, to be circumcised on that day. If you don't know what circumcision is, ask somebody beside you. They can explain it to you. I won't get into that, but it involves a knife and some delicate tissue. Okay. Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, we know Pharisees were the religious leaders. They were kind of in control in those days. There were, there were also Sadducees, but they were kind of playing second fiddle, kind of like the Republicans to the Democrats to the take over power here in a few days. Uh, they, they were, still had some influence, but the Pharisees were the ones who were most influential when Jesus was born into the world. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. It would be awful hard for us to stand before a court of law and say we are blameless. Sometimes we try to fool the judge to say we are without error. But one day we'll stand before God and the only way we can say that we are blameless is not based off of our past like Saul was talking about, Paul here, but it's based off of the blood that we're going to receive in communion as because of the sacrifice which Christ has done for us, that we can say that. But look on verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. See, Paul understood that his identity was no longer wrapped up in everything that he attained, everything he had done, what he had been born into. He understood that his identity was in Christ alone. I sometimes meet fellow believers that are so interested in telling me like a confession, well, I'm not such a bad guy. I'm, I, I'm good. You know, I don't kick the dog. I don't beat my wife. I'm, I'm basically good. I even saw one of, the, uh, one of the political leaders talk about that he believed that man was basically good and appealed to that good nature in man. I can tell you there's no good in me apart from Jesus Christ. Paul understood that and, and, and he testified to that. Everything that were his credentials as he was growing up in Judaism, he, well, let me go on and, and see what he says about it. First, he says, I, give, I, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. In verse 8, he says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. See, I think even in the church we have too many people that are still babes in Christ that I think they have brought something to add to what Jesus has done. They have brought something to show God, look at this. And we don't have anything that we can show God to do that. Now that doesn't mean that we can't <coughs> gain crowns here on earth. 
But those crowns aren't for us to keep for ourselves. It's not like we have the jewelry box and we open up and we see these crowns we have. Those crowns are to give glory to God who has given to us life eternal, which we could not gain on our own. The law was not able to make someone perfect before God. It was incomplete. That's why the sacrificial system, that's why we don't need that atonement sacrifice system now because Jesus came and paid the price. But we have to exchange our life for his life. That's the only way we can be found in Christ and Christ be found in us. Hopefully I'm not repeating that too much, but I want you to understand what God's word says. Paul says that he counts those works in his life as rubbish. Another translation calls it dung or like trash. It's, it, 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 it won't amount to anything once you stand before the judge of all humanity. He goes on to say that uh, verse 9 and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him the power of his resurrection may share in his sufferings becoming like him in death that by any means possible I may attain attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul here in these verses outlines what he has in a relationship with Jesus Christ. What you and I can have in our relationship with Christ. First thing he says is knowing Jesus is knowing God. I have a relationship with God. The second thing he says he knows his power of the resurrection. That power of the resurrection helped Jesus overcome death. Jesus died. He was in the grave for three days. But come Sunday, the first day of the week, the tomb was opened up. That was for you and for me. He didn't have to do that. He could have gone right through those stone walls. But he opened it up so we could look inside and see there was nothing inside. I have a little cartoon that I sometimes show that it shows this empty tomb. It's got a sign out in front of it, slightly used tomb for rent. Only used three days. Yes. Now, the next thing that Paul says, and we're going to probably unwrap this a little bit more in our family time groups that happen during the Sunday school. Those will be up in the other classrooms upstairs. Might take in one of those and as, as our leaders facilitate that, it, Paul says he wanted to share in the sufferings of Jesus. I don't know how often I wake up in the morning and say, I'm ready, bring it on. I want to share in your sufferings, Jesus. Now, I usually want to avoid the suffering, but not Paul. He knew that every day could be his last day. He knew that there were people that were out to get him and he was willing to share in that because of his love for the Savior and how he could say for me to live is Christ but to die is gain. Now it wasn't like that he put himself in a place where he was in trouble and, and could die but he just knew that sharing in the sufferings of Christ is a part of the godly life here on earth. And if we could get to that place to be like him and like him in his death. Not that we are resurrected back into this life like Jesus was, but we will be a part of the resurrection into life eternal. And that was the last thing that he says, that we will join him in the resurrection from the dead. And know that life which he offers to us. Now, there's one more scripture I'd like to take you to before our time is fully expired. And that's Matthew chapter 7. Matthew's gospel, need I remind you, was written first to the Jewish nation. Matthew was a Jew. Remember, he was, what is his occupation before he started following Jesus? He was a tax collector. Jews like him very much? No, they considered him to be a traitor. But he was the one that God chose to write a gospel back to the Jewish nation. And the primary thing he wanted to get across to them is Jesus is the king of the Jews. That was what he was wanting to 
to tell them. And, and in part of that, he recorded Jesus' words in this famous section from Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7 called the Sermon on the Mount. We don't know whether Jesus just preached this all in one setting or if it was something that Matthew brought together his messages and started with the Beatitudes and about fulfilling the law and, and <coughs> how there was a, a, a new lawkeeper in town. There was like a new sheriff, Jesus. And he says, this is the law. It says, you know, it says an eye for an eye and a tooth for the tooth. That's what the law says. But I tell you, love your enemy and give to those who hate you. Jesus set up higher standards. He says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better you go into eternity with one eye missing rather than both eyes and you end up in in hell of life. Jesus raised the bar through his life and ministry for us to follow through. And yet, grace is what he offered. He offered perfect truth with perfect love and he meshed them together and that's where we get grace. The grace that comes from God embodied in Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at these verses. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Just pause there for a moment. Just because you say God is your Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus says not everyone who says that will enter the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that what we're trying to get to? Isn't that like our goal to get there? You know, if we were in a group of Jehovah's Witnesses, they wouldn't have any problem with this right now because they figure only 144,000 can fit into the kingdom of heaven and they have to be on the earth. But what God's word tells us is that we will be with him in heaven. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. He is gone to make a place for us and he will come back and he'll receive us. But here, Jesus' preaching is not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So that tells me, number one, just because someone calls Jesus Lord does not assure salvation or entry into heaven. Okay? It's not our talk, it's our walk. Make your walk match your talk, and then you'll be living in the right way. And he goes on to say, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So how can you have assurance of salvation? How can you have assurance that you're going to heaven? Do the will of God. Obey his commands. Obey God. He goes on to say in verse 22, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do mighty works in your name? The second point I'd like to make on this scripture is whatever I have done in this life is of no value. It's worthless. Any excuses that you make why you're good enough to get into heaven, don't measure up. Because look at the statements here. Every statement declaring what we have done, not what Christ has done for us. The people come to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, <coughs> we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did mighty works in your name. Look at his response in the next verse, verse 23. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, it's of no value, even though you do these things, which we would consider people coming in. You know, we'd let them speak in front of the church if they prophesied, if they cast out demons. Yeah, bring it on. If they do mighty works. But see what Jesus is more interested in than what we do for him. He's more interested in having a relationship with you and with me. He, he, he died 
in order to adopt us into his family that he chose us he he called us into relationship with him and he wants us to be his followers not his do-gooders you know oftentimes we think well if I just do one more thing I'll measure up trying to get God's attention just like we try to get our parents attention at times that doesn't create the relationship the relationship is taking you just as you are remember when I stand before couples and God is looking down from above and a husband and a wife are making their vows one to another they're saying that they're committing that no matter how hard it gets no matter how rough it is no matter what changes come in our lives, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish. But God's got this, and he knows what you're going through. He brings us together, and that's what Jesus was saying. It's not the stuff you do for me. Do you get it, church? Jesus says to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Get out of here. It's not the works that you do that get you into the club. But it's the relationship that you have, that you've been given, that you stand in by faith. My ID in Christ is made up of these four things. Let me give you a, a statement with a scripture. You might want to write this down because you're adopted. If you ever hear uh, a preacher say in front of you, hey, is anyone here adopted? Put your hand up and say, yeah, I'm adopted. If you are in Christ, if it doesn't matter whether you were adopted on earth, you know, on earth or, or anything, but if you were in Christ, he has adopted you. Ephesians 1.5 talks about we are adopted in as sons and daughters uh, Ephesians 2 19 goes on further to share about that uh, another thing of my idea in Christ is I am chosen you know do you know I'm one of God's favorites yeah I am and you are too because he chooses you you now you have to choose him back right he can't just choose you apart from you choosing him back, receiving that gift of salvation. But it's not just fire insurance that you got a savior. It's you make him Lord over your life. Uh, another thing is I'm called. Now you might say, sure, you're called. You're called to be a minister. You're called to be a pastor. No, you are called too. We are called as children of God. Uh, where you see I am chosen, uh, you can go to 1 Peter chapter 2, 9. Go to Colossians 3, uh, 12, uh, different scriptures that we are chosen. But I am called, John 6, 44, uh, gives us a little insight into that. Where Jesus says, no one can come to the, me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. We are called, Ephesians 4, 1, that he has called us into relationship with him. And the fourth thing is, not only am I adopted, am I chosen, am I called, I am a follower. Now, a lot of times we want to be the leaders. You know, we want to have our names up in the lights. We, we want to be seen as the one that's out in front. I have no problem knowing that I'm not in command of this church. I'm not in command of even my family, but God is here with me. He is the one leading the way, and I'm a follower. Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. If you try to keep your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. And so we see that someone is calling someone right now but it's probably not God that's doing doing that calling hey you remember the bulletin the quiz let me just give you to this is uh, uh, did anybody get all the answers to the to the crossword puzzle 
Ah, we did. Okay, we'll rely on you in case I get it wrong. Okay. So, uh, start with one down. Opposite of a leader is a follower. Imagine that. Okay, number two. Looking ahead. Vision. Yes, all about the vision that we have. Number three, getting bigger. You grow, you grow. That's right. Number four, green light means go. Yellow light means, <laughs> I, thought, I thought I'd get that. <laughs> and number five, come together, gather, gather. This is the theme of our church. If you wonder what we're all about, is we are here to gather, that we might become the people of God. We, we're here to grow, be discipled, be trained, raised up, take advantage of the program offerings that we have to do that, and to go, to go on missions, whether it be short-term missions like we were on last spring when the pandemic hit, or where we send people out into mission or ministry. There's a, a church that's meeting out in a field up in Austin, Colorado, called uh, Church of the Cross. Shane and Amanda Keir. Shane is the pastor of that. Shane was raised up right here in this church and set out to do ministry in that church. And, and we are, 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 that's what we're about is to send people out into mission and ministry in different places. Uh, gather, grow, and go. Uh, we are setting the vision and, and that vision is that we are all followers of Christ and he is leading us in this way but if you don't have a relationship with Christ you don't have your ID in Christ you don't want to wait until you get to the pearly gates or your entrance into heaven and say okay what did I do with that ID no our ID is through Christ and a relationship with him and we'll help you through the offerings of the church to know how to have that relationship remember it's not based on who you are or what you've done based on who he is and what he's done for us. I'd like to invite the deacons to come up and the worship team to come back again as, as we now bring it all together in this time of communion. Uh, I want you to see we uh, had some zealous deacons. Looks like they were expecting a really big crowd today. Uh, but we have these communion cups that are self-contained. Who can receive communion at First Baptist Church? We only need four of you up here. We got a bunch of deacons. We're going to be training and, and bringing up. But I, I need two, two. Uh, and, and we're going to send these out. But uh, there is bread in the top of this little cup. And then there is grape juice underneath. Uh, you'll be able to open it up by just kind of playing with a clear... Uh, the clear part on the top and it should peel back. If it doesn't peel back for you, and I had a lady in church yesterday that she says, uh, Pastor, I need a little help. So you can offer and maybe somebody else can peel it back for you. There is a three-sided little tab that you pull that back. Watch out, don't get the grape juice on you, but you pull that back and it opens up the juice that we'll take later on after the song. But Jesus, on the night before he went to the cross, he uh, took the bread and the, it was a Passover meal. The Passover was uh, something that they had been doing in, in Jewish families since the Jewish people had come out of Egypt. The Passover was a reminder that... Uh, the Jewish families, the tenth and final plague, which Pharaoh finally let the people go, was the plague of the death of the firstborn. How many, any firstborns here with us today, willing to admit it? Firstborn in the family, if you didn't have the blood of the lamb over your doorpost, the angel of death would come in and you would be no more. You would die. But if you had the blood of the lamb over the doorpost, then that angel of death would pass over and you would be safe. And so Jesus was sharing in that Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room and he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Take and eat. 
Before he did that, though, he said a prayer. He also took the cup and he shared it with them. We're not going to take a common cup. You're going to all have your individual cups. And we do have some waste baskets here in the center aisle that you can place your cups into when you get done with them after the service. But Jesus gave thanks to the Father and let us give thanks to the Father at this point too. Heavenly Father, thank you for all who are here. Anyone can receive the communion if they have received Christ into their heart or if they're on the way and they know the truth and they have experienced the life. Maybe today is the day when we sang earlier in the service, we have decided to follow Jesus. That someone here said, yes, I want to follow Jesus. I accept you as my Savior. I make you my Lord of my life that you can receive this communion knowing that this is Jesus offering his body and his blood for you as a sacrifice for the, your sin. You must understand that we're all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. The wages of our sin is, is, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. He offers this exchange, life to life, his life for yours and my life. Lord, thank you for this bread and for the fruit of the vine we're about to receive in Jesus name so the deacons will go and they'll serve you and uh, if you'd like to receive it just take one I might also say that if there's any family members here that have family members that aren't here and you want to experience communion with them I think we have enough communion today that you could take some home to those other family members and prayerfully offer the communion to them in the same way we're doing it right now you may have a neighbor who you see isn't here, and, but you're friends with them, and you just like to take some communion to them and offer it in the name of Jesus Christ. You're welcome to do that with this communion that's served here today. As you receive it, don't, don't go ahead and open it up fully. We'll do that as we receive it. But uh, prayerfully right now, just meditate on what you have heard here today as you're about to receive this gift from Jesus. tab comes off. I'm going to invite everybody to stand up with me. It's just another way to show honor to Jesus our Lord. And you can pull the bread out. The, you know, it's interesting that uh, Jesus offered the bread 
We just celebrated Christmas. Jesus was born. Where was Jesus born? In a manger. In what town? Bethlehem. Bethlehem is made up of two Hebrew words. Viet, which means house, and Lechem, lechem uh, which means bread. House of bread. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and he is the bread of life. Take and eat in remembrance of him. And then you can slightly pull on the tab to reveal the grape juice within that represents the blood of the lamb. Remember that doorpost that the blood was smeared over so the children of Israel would not have the angel of death come in and take the firstborn? On a hill called Calvary, Jesus went outside of Jerusalem. He allowed himself to be nailed to that cross. Remember, his back was opened up because of all the stripes that he had taken. And his blood was splattered on that beam, on that wooden door. Just as the blood was splattered on the door in Egypt over the Israelite homes, that they might be set free through that blood. There's that blood that was splattered on the cross, not the cross in and of itself, but the blood of the Lamb that was given for us, that covers over our sins. And praise God that we be covered with the blood of the Lamb. Take and drink in remembrance of Him. When we I invite you to join, join in this song of celebration. If you want to take the, take the thing back, throw it that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see was blind was blind but now I see one more time was blind but now I see May the grace, the mercy, and the love of God be yours forevermore. In Christ we pray. Amen.